Hey, it's Kelly Carter from Another Act. Today I sit down with actor, director, and writer Mo McRae. We talk about his new film, Star Keisha, which airs March 7th on Hulu. And I have him weigh on on the most controversial sports take of all time. Mo McRae's acting career spans nearly two decades. He got his big break in 2006 playing high school athlete Leon Hayes in Great Iron Gang, which also starred The Rock. Since then, he's gone on to play many more roles in a variety of different TV projects, including ABC's Rebel, Fox's hit drama Empire, crime drama Sons of Anarchy, and action heist film Den of Thieves, and that's just to name a few. In addition to his prolific acting career, he recently has gone behind the camera as a writer and a director. McRae's directorial debut, titled A Lot of Nothing, stars Alain Noel and Cleopatra Coleman and is executive produced by David Oyelowo. McRae's latest project as director and writer is a stunning short film called Sarkeesha. The story centers around a young black woman who wants to climb the corporate ladder, but struggles with her identity. Right before her big interview, she slips and falls into a wonderful world of black beauty and wonder. Sarkeesha is a story about self-discovery, and McRae's own journey is certainly reflective of that as well. Join us as we dive into another act with Mo McRae. Starkeisha. Tell me a little bit more about this new project that you have, Starkeisha. You're doing it in collaboration with Anscape, and it really feels like it's in line with this intentional art that you want to have that creates conversation. So the Starkeisha project came to me in a very interesting way. It's pretty amazing because uh, a close friend of mine, a guy named Jathan Wilson, who had been working at Disney and working with The Undefeated. They had been putting out these albums, these EPs, called Music for the Movement. Mm. And he wanted to do something that felt more narrative to support the music. So he called me and asked if I'd be interested. He told me about the artists and what the messaging was and the themes. And I was like, yeah, I definitely want to create something. So we started bouncing ideas and I would go away and write and kind of came with the whole idea of this young woman going on this fantastical journey, very much inspired loosely by like a Alice in Wonderland type of journey. Mm -hmm. And seeing like a young black woman trying to discover herself by going within herself mm. was a thing I was really fascinated with, especially like being a father to a daughter who was very much, I'm constantly trying to let her know she's special as she is, not having to subscribe to anybody else's parameters being placed around her. Mm -hmm. So this film felt like a great opportunity for me to do that and touch on those themes that they wanted and things that I was interested in. Yeah. What is it that you're getting from directing that maybe you don't get from acting? Control, not just like, <laughs> That's real, though. Oh, That's man. real. Well, well, directing for me is like this amazing opportunity that encompasses just about every single thing that I'm interested in as a man, as a person, as an artist. Like I've been doing photography for quite some time. As you know, I've been an actor, I write. And, and so all these things that I'm interested in, music, everything that I gravitate towards, mm -hmm. I almost get to funnel through the position of being a director. Mm. And then in the leadership thing and the, and the collaboration, like all those things that I'm like, I'm just really connected to. I feel like it's a part of like my calling and my purpose all kind of goes under the auspice of being a director. Do you think that you want to stay in this area or do you want to go back into, into acting while also figuring out how to direct more projects too. Yeah, I want to live my life in a way that I wake up 
And that day, how I feel, determines what I do. Mm. And then looking at my years kind of in the same way of like, okay, I feel like I want to go back and do a movie as an actor. Or I might take a year off and just do photography. I just want to live like in a way where I just, wherever I feel called, mm. that's where I want to show up. Mm. I know it's very early in your, in your directing career, <laughs> but what have you taken or what do you envision taking from directing that you're going to apply to being an actor? Like, what have you picked up so far that makes you maybe want to remix a little bit how you approach the craft of acting? That's a great question. That's a great question. I think as a director, I've always, just in general, I always have had an attitude of like, whether it's the janitor or the CEO, everybody gets my love, respect. Yeah. But I feel like even more so now after directing, as an actor, I just even more want to like celebrate the crew mm. as an actor. Like I really want to just find more and more ways to let them know that I appreciate their efforts because as a director, I get to see the dolly grip and the camera ops and everybody, the gaffer, what time they come in, how hard they work and what time they leave. And it's a thankless job. Yeah. So I think I have a heightened level of awareness in, in terms of the level of gratitude I need to have as an actor where basically they want me to just show up, hit my mark, say my lines, be great and go home. I want to take more opportunity to just show love to everybody else in the process. Mm, I love that. I love that a lot. You know, there feels like there's this connective tissue between your first feature length film and Star Keisha. They both have a message. You know, they both are communicating and putting something out there in the world that when you walk away from seeing them, a conversation is sparked. Is that what you're looking to do as a creator? Are you looking for projects specifically that continue a conversation? Um, or is that just a happy accident that it worked out that way? No, I 100% want to create things that cause us to have conversation mm -hmm. with other people and ourselves, like mm -hmm. private conversations, things that in those intimate moments of being alone, you could think about the movie and, and where did you fit into it? Like, where does your moral compass lie in that? Or where are you in your journey as it relates to the journeys of some of the protagonists in the films I create? Because I think of like my whole life, the things that I've uh, gravitated towards as an audience member always made me think and feel and want to talk about it. And I feel like somewhere along the line, we got uh, really enamored with the idea of things just happening quickly. Mm. So it's like somebody makes something, you see it, consumed it. That was dope, what's next? Yeah. That was dope, what's next? I wanna create stuff that's like, whoa, I need to process this yeah. and think about it. What did you feel about it? Yeah. That's the kind of stuff I wanna create because I feel like there's an opportunity for community and growth in that. Mm -hmm. So um, I love hearing all of that. That's great because it feels like the work that you're doing is very intentional specifically behind the camera, what's the message that you want people to take away from Starkeisha? Embrace who you are. Mm. That's a big thing for me with that film. It's like whoever you are, whatever you are, that's amazing. It's mm. beautiful. You don't have to fit into anything else. Like and your greatest existence is in you being your greatest version of your true self. Like mm -hmm. whenever you try to become something you're not, you'll never be happy. Yeah. So what was that first moment of realization that this actually was attainable for you? Tell me, tell me about that first role, that first audition, that first whatever it was that made you say, actually, I think I can do this. On a professional level? Yeah. So outside of like the high school experience? Yeah. Uh, let's see. The first thing that made me feel like I could actually do it. I mean, it's probably the first commercial I booked because it started off like all these like big dreams and these grandiose ideas of what this acting career was going to be like after high school. And then I ended up bagging groceries <laughs> and working as an extra mm. and riding the bus all around trying to get places as an extra. Mm. And so when I finally ended up being able to have an agent and start auditioning just for commercials, and the first time I booked a commercial, I was like, oh, okay, I think I can do it. Because I came in and saw all the people I had to beat. Yeah. A lot of them looked like me. 
Yeah. And it's like, damn, that guy looks just like me. Like, we could be cousins. <laughs> Which was kind of weird, too, to see so many people in, in, uh, identifying the type that yeah. I was in. Yeah. And being around that type and then being the one that was selected to have the role. It was a uh, it was like a Dodge Caravan commercial or something like that. <laughs> they did like a parody on award shows. Mm. And so that was the thing. That was the first gig that I auditioned and got and then got paid and... I was like, okay, I can do this. That felt like a good moment, I bet. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. But then, of course, years go by. You find success in commercials, which is very lucrative, as you know. And people live really great lives doing that. But you were still hungering for a little bit more. And then you got that first feature film with none other than The Rock. I mean, I, I mean... I don't even know if I have to say anything more beyond that, but tell me about that moment and and what that felt like for you. That was a uh, defining moment, not just in my career, mm -hmm. but in my life. Yeah. And there's a story around that that I've never really spoken about publicly, mm -hmm. but I feel like now I'm at a stage in my life where I really want to be very open about my journey and how I got here. During that period, I was already, you know, kind of in my acting career, finding my way, transitioned out of being an extra, now graduated into like gangster guest star roles on all the crime shows mm. on TV, doing the rounds. And through this audition process for Gridiron Gang, I still live in South Central. I still live in my neighborhood. I still have the same friends. Some of my friends are like gang members and criminals. Some of my friends are actors. I'm like in this real kind of hybrid mode in my life with one foot in these two very different worlds. Yeah. And I remember the day that uh, I got the call, before getting the call that I was going to be in the film, I had this issue with somebody. And they oh, they did something. They basically like hustled me out of some money. And I was ready to just take it to the maximum level mm -hmm. of retribution against this person. And as soon as I saw him, I went looking for the person. And luckily, and thank God, the person, I couldn't find him. Mm -hmm. And when I came home, the phone was ringing and I pick up the phone. And it's my agent at the time telling me I got the role in Gridiron Gang. And the crazy thing about that for me is just like how my life based on the choices and the decisions I was making, if I want to go deeper into like the environment that I was in yeah. or transition out of that environment, that movie kind of showed me the path that I should be on and I should be making choices in alignment with where I want to be, especially with that specific story because it was touching on juvenile delinquents and our mm -hmm. um, being detained in this facility and then The Rock's character, the coach, builds this football program and gives them something co to connect to, to find the best version of themselves. So it was like almost kismet. Yeah. That story itself, me being a part of that film, me to feel, um, realizing like my bigger picture goals and being able to be a, a source of inspiration mm -hmm. through all my own personal trials and tribulations all happened via that film. That sounds like it was a really defining moment for you too in life and something that I would imagine that you probably carry with you as you have navigated this space and this and this career. Where did you go from, from Gridiron Games? Where did I go in terms of um, interesting thing about that? So that movie, I got like a three picture deal with Sony mm -hmm. and you know, working with The Rock, and they sending a driver, pick me up, take me to set every day, filming this movie. And then my career tanked. Really? Stand still. Okay, no phone calls coming No in. phone calls. It was this very weird thing where I was actually like 25 years old, something like that, mm -hmm. 25, 26, but I was playing a 17 year old in that film. Yeah. So then I got to that point where I didn't fully look like I could be 17 anymore, but didn't look like I was my actual age. Yeah. And so my whole career was just on pause. Mm. And then one of the greatest things that ever could have happened, I became a father for the first time. So I was able to just focus on being a father and then kind of redefine and develop more skills and craft to try to get into that next leg of my career. I was gonna ask, you know, how tough was it for you to go from gridiron gang to not getting any phone calls? What kept you going? And it feels like fatherhood is probably the thing, but, but what did you tell yourself 
when the phone wasn't ringing with regards to your career in, in Hollywood? Because I can imagine that had to feel a little bit humbling to go from working with The Rock to then nothing, you know? Um, but what did you tell yourself to keep you in the game and to keep you out of feeling completely discouraged so that you reverted back to maybe where you were before you got that call about that film? Hmm. I mean, so Gridiron Gang happens, everything goes quiet, and to be completely honest, it was me telling myself a lot of different things. Mm. It was me telling myself that I wouldn't work again, that everything that I happened was luck. Mm. It was me telling myself, no, you're great, you just have to persevere, be better, take this as an opportunity to grow. It was this is unfair, how come this person is working? So yeah. it just fluctuated day by day. But ultimately, the biggest thing that came out of it was just fatherhood and, and, and wanting to be a man that could provide for my kid, which my father did not provide for me because he wasn't there. Mm. That being the commitment first and foremost, and then taking it as an opportunity to do what I call like eliminating reasons. So whatever reasons why I wasn't getting the call, if he wouldn't think I was skilled enough, mm -hmm. I did whatever I could to make money to get back into acting class and develop my skill and to read and to express myself artistically in other ways. And that's where writing and all those other things began to happen in that quiet period is mm -hmm. where it began for me. Mm. Now the good news, of course, is that things did pick back up eventually <laughs> and you started working all across the dial, uh, for starters. Um, so I know that had to feel pretty good for you, but something else also happened, I think, while you were picking up those credits, is you started thinking about doing things other than being in front of the camera. Where were you in your career when you started thinking about what happens when you're not in front of the camera? Like, what was happening in your life at that time? Yeah, it was in that same period, after mm. Gridiron Gang, and, and still feel like I had so much to offer in, in terms of being an artist and a storyteller. And I did end up getting to do, I got an offer out of nowhere. Literally the day my daughter was born, wow. my first ever straight offer was to like do this movie for a lifetime. Mm. And I needed the money. Yeah. And so I read the script. I'm like, there's like a picture, I'm sure, of me holding a baby and I'm reading the script at the same time. And doing that movie for Lifetime, the director of it, who became a dear mentor of mine, a guy named Harry Weiner, mm -hmm. I just loved the way he operated the set and how creative he was. And I reached out to him and shared that I had a desire to learn more about the industry beyond acting. So he kind of mentored me and helped me learn how to write Mm. and study directing, what to read, and all those things. So that was the period where I was like, I don't want to just wait for permission to be creative. Mm. I saw people out that could help me with the skills to start taking control of the narrative myself. Waiting for permission to be creative. I love that you said that. Where does your courage come from to do something that is unexpected of you? Because I know a lot of times once you introduce yourself as one thing, mm. it can be challenging for this industry to see you as anything other than that one thing that you kind of entered the business with. So where does that courage come from? You are hitting all the things. You did all your homework, <laughs> research, you were dialed in. This is amazing. Where did Love the it. courage come from? Yeah. I, I am definitely a person that believes like ultimately everything I have was kind of already in me. I feel like it came from the creator, God, just, and then those things have just been cultivated and nourished by people like my grandmother, my, my family, like my wife, my kids, like just different people. Uh, but on a, on a very specific level, I feel like that courage for me is just like a, a burning desire. It's like this passion. I feel called to do great things and to be great and not let the doubts and fears and insecurities of other people yeah. prevent me from doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing, which is hard because sometimes my own fears and doubts get in the way, but when I could quell those voices, whether it's mine or those other people, the courage is just, it's already there. I think everybody has it. That's the thing too. Like you look at uh, anybody, whether it's Picasso or Kanye or anybody, I feel like we all have it 
It's just a matter of if we're willing to tap into it. Yeah. That's it. Like, it's all there. And I just had the willingness to tap in and, and um, unleash it and just exist in it. And unleash you are doing right now as we're talking. Um, how did you know that this was the right time for you to work on your directorial debut, which will be premiering at South by Southwest? Um, why was that the right project and why is now the right time for this moment? Oh, man. It's funny because the right time as, as it pertains to like where we are in the yeah. world when it comes out, yeah. as opposed to when I had the idea that time, mm. very different things. Like I was initially inspired by the film, I think shortly after the uh, murder of Trayvon Martin. Mm. And like these things, these travesties are taking place and these injustices and we all get so riled up. And what do we do? We go to social media. Yeah. And maybe we go to a protest, mm -hmm. but then we got to go back to work. Mm -hmm. We got to pay our own bills. We got our relationship things. So there were these things, uh, these ideals that I was very like fascinated with exploring based on myself and the conversations I was having. So I just started like trying to find a way into telling this type of story because I feel like art is the best way to have conversation. Yeah because you could pose questions, you get a captive audience, it's like in a, in a, in a, in a um, conversation, we have discourse, so you might not listen to me because you're waiting to say what you want to say next. But I knew if I could take all these questions I had and put it into a film, I could get a point across mm. better. And that was like kind of like the impetus that led me to creating the story. So that particular time is just when the inspiration hit. Okay. And then circumstances of the world have led it to now being the time for it to premiere. Mm. And each time it got delayed, because there were a lot of delays throughout the first idea. I made a short film first that I self-financed and called a dear friend of mine, Makai Pfeiffer, and I got a wonderful actress, Parisa Fitzhenley, to be in this little short film to mm. kind of test the idea out. Mm -hmm. And then before my agent said, okay, the short is great, write the feature, then I get the money, get into production, then it gets shut down by COVID for 15 months, and then it come back, mm. and then it leads to the perfect time, okay. which is right now. Which is right now, yeah. So what does it take for you to say yes at this point in your career? I must say, you ask incredible questions. Thank you. No, really, like, these are very... Uh, for quite some time in my career, I've actually been hesitant about doing interviews and a lot of this type of engagement because it feels very surface and useless and like a waste of time. I'd rather be just doing something that feels meaningful, but I feel like the type of questions you're asking are really like beautiful and refreshing and insightful. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I think for me to say yes right now just has a feel like there's an opportunity for, I guess, two things to happen me to feel fulfilled creatively. And then there's a high likelihood that whatever that audience is, that they can connect to it and it can resonate with them. Kind of just going back to that same thing and want to create things that make people need to stop and process and take it in. Mm. Like in a way a great piece of, like a great painting does. Like mm. you don't just walk by a great painting. It steals that time from you. Yeah. So if I not come across things that are like that, I'm like, yes. And if it's not that, then it's kind of like, oh, I don't really know. Yeah. I don't know why I would do it at this point. Yeah. And that applies to who you are as an actor, too? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, very much so. Yeah. No, that's great to hear. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking about is that uh, we're really starting to see a lot of actors, young Black actors in particular, decide that they want to become creators. The generation before you didn't know that they could do that. Mm -hmm. Denzel is just now starting to direct. Holly Berry just directed her first film. But now we're seeing yourself, Zoe Kravitz, Michael B. Jordan, like a lot of young 30-something, early 40-something-year-old actors saying, I actually want to control the narrative. Why do you think that's happening? Because it feels like something bigger than just a one-off. I think, I think there is something to that. Yeah, I think there is something in like the 
collective consciousness right now that is letting us know that we are actually far more capable and powerful than they ever allowed us to see. Mm. So it's like the mirror in front of us had a lot of dirt on the mirror, so we could only see parts of ourselves. Yeah. And over time, we've all been collectively chipping away, and we're like, oh, I didn't even know I had this much strength in this part of my body. Yeah. They only show us these certain elements, and there's all this, also this idea, too, of like, be content. Mm. Be grateful for what you have. You should yeah. be happy to be here. Yeah. Whereas now I feel like we're less likely to be happy with the plate they're giving us, and it's more like, no, I should own this home. Why right. am I? Why would I be happy with a plate when I should have the whole house? Right. I should own a restaurant. Yeah. I'm not just happy to come here. I want to own it, and that I think is just uh, over time. And thank God for Denzel because of what he did as an actor in all that time. He's a part of it in terms of getting to see this strong, powerful, dignified black man who was just exemplary you know, on so many levels. And I think, once again, I like to think about things in terms of like transferable skills and mm. like, okay, what he exhibited there as an actor, Obama was able to take and do as a president. What Obama did as a president, I could do as a filmmaker. What I do as a filmmaker, some other kid could do as an architect mm. because they see those things and those traits are universal. Yeah. So I think it's just all there. We're just seeing it now. Yeah. We're just fighting to see it now. Yeah, and you know what I also think is really important is that you guys are able to give us a new lens with which to see the world. And we know how important that is because we look at something, quite frankly, like the murder of George Floyd. Partly why, why something like that happens is because of the imagery that is put out there about black men, about black people. If you only are seeing one thing, we're conditioned to think th that's what's out there. But I think that it feels like directing and producing and being a creator of content in Hollywood feels revolutionary in a way that I don't know if it felt before. Like it feels like there is this intention to make sure that we're seeing a kaleidoscope of images of black people so that we're not looked at as being just one thing. And I don't know if that's something that you think about as a creator or director, especially now, and especially with the projects that you're behind right now, is that? Yeah, I definitely think about representation mm -hmm. and just the breadth of that, right? And what does that mean? And because I tried to do it in my acting career where it was like, okay, I started out doing a lot of roles that made my grandmother uncomfortable. Because mm. she knows me to be a uh, nuanced, intelligent, caring, thoughtful young man that she you know, raised and like, harbored in her home. And then she sees me on TV being a gangster and a thug and doing these types of things. That disconnect was very disturbing for her. Yeah. So throughout my acting career, I had to decide, like, whoa, I need to be sure that I'm making choices to portray us in a nuanced way. And I said that I wouldn't play a guy that was in the streets, but he has to be in the streets. He has to have a heart. Yeah. He has to have love. There has to be dimensionality there. And and I think as a, as a storyteller, the same thing is where I'm looking at these characters and it's like, okay, they could do this thing, but what's on the other side? And also making sure that we're never portrayed as like a monolithic group. So I try to avoid conversations with people come to me like, Mo, so how do black people feel about I can't speak for all black people? There are so many different points of view yeah. within our community. So as a creator, I love the opportunity, like in the um and a lot of nothing, not to do like a shameless plug kind of thing like that. Please, but yeah. I try to create this thing where like the four main characters that are black have extremely different points of view. Mm in a way that I think some people that, well, I'm just being completely candid here, white, I had white execs read the script early on, was like, well, do black people really speak like this? Mm. That was a real question. Yeah. They weren't sure about the realness of the fact that black people, black people speak this way. Yeah. So I can be mad at him, I have to take the onus on us and say, wow, we're not finding our voice in a way and being able to put it out there to where people can see all the things that exist. Mm. They, they're just not aware. I'm not mad at them. I took it on me. It was like, oh, okay, he doesn't know this is real. I'll, I'll take the responsibility to show him. 
But the truth is you you didn't have to take responsibility because in a lot of ways that's Hollywood's doing too. Because if you only right. give people one note of, of a culture, of a community, that that's that's not our fault. That's whoever was green lighting whatever projects that came long before we were ever conceived of too. But that's what I love about seeing these new creators coming in like yourself and saying, yes. Black people can be many different things. Yes. Let me show you four examples of who we can be. So kudos to you for that. I'm going to I'm going to present a couple of little things out of you and you you know how to answer. So this is where people always get jammed up. You this is where people get here. jammed up. Okay. Okay, but I feel like I feel like you're going to you're going to ace this. You're going to do very well. You're going to get that A like you got in drama class Let's go. back in the day. Let's go. Way to use my past to weave into where always, we want to go in the always. future. Good job. Who would win in a fight, Leon Hayes or Tyler? Oh, that's a good one. I'm going to say Tyler. Okay. I'm going okay. to go Tyler. Tyler wins in the fight. Why Leon, Because Tyler? Tyler was like a real gang member. Okay. Leon Hayes was like the little fun quarterback that liked to play mad, and he wasn't a tough guy. So I'll go Tyler. Okay, I like that. Um, you're an L.A. native. Yes. So this is probably the most controversial question anyone has ever asked you. in and out or fat burger? Oh. I know. It's so hard. Okay. I got to preface this one. Uh-huh. The proper answer is definitely in and out, right? Okay. But I don't go with the proper or the popular just for the sake of. I personally have eaten more fat burger okay. than I have in and out. So I prefer fat burger. That's an excellent choice. And this last one actually might be a little bit more controversial than that one. Because um, I'm going to name off two phenomenal athletes that people are going to debate for the rest of time and ask you to pick one. Are you ready? Yes. Mo McRae or Blip Sanders? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Oh, I got to just go Mo McRae. Mo I McRae? I'm just that kind of guy. You just, you, I got to you know. go me. Although Blip was in, a, in the majors, he did play. But I believe in my heart if I wanted to, I could have made it to the league okay. in any of the major sports. If that's what my passion was, I okay. believe I could have made and it to the league. And you could have bested Blip Sanders. Yes. All yes. right. All right. Mo McRae, that was excellent. Thank you so much for taking time out Thank to chat with so me much. today. Thank you so much. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you.